Welcome to the Cold Case Christianity Broadcast, the only Christian case-making program hosted by a cold case homicide detective. Jay Warner Wallace has been investigating cold case murders in Los Angeles County for over a decade. His work has been featured on Fox News, Court TV, and Dateline. For more information about Jim's work and the case for Christianity, please visit coldcasechristianity.com. Now, here's your host, Jay Warner Wallace. Welcome back to Season 5 of Cold Case Christianity. If you've been watching us this season, you know that we are covering um, objections. And we call these quick shot responses. These are the quick responses you can offer to the most common objections against Christianity offered by atheists, offered by your friends and family members. It's offered by people who do not believe Christianity is true online. And and what we've tried to do is to stage these and create these for a a special function. Look, a lot of times, the people in your life who have an objection to Christianity have come across it by stubbing their toe on the hardships of life. I mean, not everyone is just a kind of a cocky, quick responder trying to knock you down in your Christian faith. A lot of people have would like for Christianity to be true, but they've experienced things in their own lives that cause them doubts, that cause them to, to reject Christianity. Sometimes these are going to be voiced to you in conversation. You're going to have to help people, and sometimes what you need to do is put your arm around people. Look, I want to focus before we start on today's topic. I just want to focus on the relationship between truth and, and, and relationships. It's this justice and mercy, right? Law and grace. We we see this kind of described in a number of different ways online. We see it described in a number of different ways in Scripture. But this is there's a reality behind those descriptions. It's it's that you have the best opportunity to communicate truth to somebody if you are already in the context of deep relationships. That's why sending someone a video from our website, from, from our TV show, won't have the same impact that you would have personally if you began to, to become the expert yourself. Pointing someone to an expert does not have the same impact that you could have if you just learn what the expert knows. Why? Because you have a relationship with the person to whom you're speaking. And that really is key. It's us developing relationships because, yes, I want to pro- proclaim truth, but I know that I'll have the best chance of influencing people with truth if we're already in relationship. And that's why sometimes as a speaker, you're trying to, to, to develop this relationship with your audience because you know you've got a better chance of sharing truth if you're already in some kind of relationship. So as I offer these these responses to you, understand that these are just the truth side. I can't create for you the relationship side. That's something you're gonna have to work to do in the context of your own relationships with your friends and family members. But remember that the truth is powerful only when it's, it's not an either or, it's a both and. Truth and relationship really create the maximum amount of influence. That being said, we still want to offer good responses uh, to help you navigate those conversations. Conversations that, for the most part, could be a little bit difficult if somebody offers an objection that seems like it is um, well-versed, it's rhetorically powerful. And look, although people encounter hardships and, and, and develop doubts in their own life, sometimes there's other tales that are wagging the dog, and they're just responding to a, a, a meme they saw online, uh, a tweet they saw from an atheist. And a lot of times what we're doing is helping you to over, overcome those kinds of objections, the objections that maybe have been most popular online. And that's what we're going to do today. As you know, if you go online to our website at uh, coldcasechristianity.com, you will see that we have a, a, a series of quick shots If you just go to our phone app, there's a tab on the website. Go to the phone app because the phone app has the easiest access to these quick shots. Our phone app is designed for you to be able to navigate through these quickly on just a single screen. So in other words, if you've got an objection that's being you're handling right there in real time and you want to step away from the conversation for a second, open the phone app, get to the uh, objection on quick shots. You'll see in the first paragraph how to respond to it. Off you go. We've also assembled these on the website. In our writing section, go to the writings tab, you'll see a quick shot subsection. Go to the quick shots, you'll see we're starting to assemble all of these there as well. So, we, and by the way, those are all printable. 
We've designed the website so that you can save the PDF file and it's just the text box. In other words, you won't have the header from the website, all the extra toolbars, all the sidebars, that stuff's taken out. You can print all of these without any of that. You can save all of these as PDF files without any of that. That's the way the website's designed. We want to give you the free resources you need to become a better Christian case maker. That being said, this week we're going to talk about an objection that I think is rhetorically powerful. This may not fall in the category of kind of like, you know, the problem of evil or, or, or things that your friends or family members have experienced that have caused them to think deeply or wonder if Christianity is true. This is sometimes just pushed out there on the internet by form of some type of atheist meme or someone's going to tweet something about how you Christians, based on your scripture, the nature of your ghastly God, you endorse slavery because your scripture endorses slavery. Now think about that. Most of us in the world know that slavery is not, uh, is not uh, morally virtuous, yet your God seems to allow for it in the Old Testament, even command how slaves are to be taken in the Old Testament. And then in the New Testament, you've got Paul writing about, he's writing to us, listen, no, nowhere do you hear anyone denounce slavery. Paul certainly doesn't denounce slavery. In fact, he writes as though slavery is accepted in the New Testament, as if it's okay to own slaves in the New Testament. How could you believe any holy scripture? Today, for example, if somebody came up and said he was speaking for God, yet he was somebody who was a racist who endorsed slavery, or just somebody, forget about race, for any reason endorsed slavery even within the same race, you would say, I am not, that is not from God. Yet you've got a holy book, the Bible, which in the Old Testament either commands the taking of slaves, or authorizes the way tra slaves are to be taken, or regulates the way they are to be treated, as if it's normal, and then you have a New Testament in which Never is slavery denounced, and in fact, it is embraced as though it's part of life. Really? That, that Holy Scripture, especially if it reflects the nature of your God, is abominable, right? I mean, we know, even as humans, how morally repulsive slavery is. Well, your God doesn't seem to know that, because He certainly either endorses it, authorizes it, regulates it, and treats it as though it's normal in both the Old and the New Testament. Now, I think that objection, in one form or another, you will see either graphically in a kind of a, uh, an image meme or in, in a tweet or a post somebody will put on social media. You've probably seen it. Maybe you've thought about it yourself. Maybe you've wondered how you would respond to it. What I want to do today is offer you a couple of quick ways to respond to it, okay? Now, remember, before we get into those, I, I just want to remind you that these are not things that uh, we can um, we can we can just throw out there, and they'll be word for word appropriate in any setting you happen to be in. Clearly, I think you already know that you're going to have to contextualize this in your own language, right? The last thing you want it to do is to sound as though it is coming directly from someone like me. No, what you want is to to learn the material in such a way that you can rearticulate. We often say that as good Christian case makers, which is what we're trying to do by having this show, is, is to help you become a good Christian case maker. We often say that we are trying to learn how to become translators. So when we find some authoritative source on any question, we will then learn how to translate that for our friends. Because sometimes that source is going to be at such a high level, you're going to have to translate it down or translate it up depending on who you're talking to in the context. Let's take a break. When we come back, I want to give you two different ways to respond to this objection that, that somehow, for some reason, um, God, your God, authorizes slavery. This is an important objection that, is, is, it, is that he condones slavery on top, on top of it all. This is an important objection that we have to be able to address. And I think it's something that really, for the most part, could be a little bit troubling. If you read through the Old Testament, where they'll point you to the verses, and you read those verses, you're going, wow, it sure sounds like God condones slavery. Let's talk about that after the break. Be sure to download the free Cold Case Christianity app from the iTunes Store and the Android Marketplace. The Cold Case Christianity app puts all the resources from coldcasechristianity.com in the palm of your hand. You can read the daily blog, listen to podcasts, and watch videos from within the application. And Jim uses the app to send direct messages to fans of Cold Case Christianity. 
The app will also link you to all the Cold Case Christianity social media and provide you with a direct connection to J. Warner Wallace. Download the app today and become a better Christian case maker. Okay, so now let's talk about how we might respond to the objection that God, that your Bible, that the God of the New Testament, Old Testament, Yahweh, condones slavery. All right? I'm going to put these up on the screen as I always do. And I just do this so you can kind of see how short. Now, you'll notice as I'm speaking this out as a response that I'm actually sometimes extending each sentence, each sentence in the response that I provided for you both in our phone app and online. Because I'm trying to give it to you in the briefest possible way, but at the same time, you know you're going to have to contextualize this. So, so one way as you're watching along in the paragraph as I speak it, you will see that the way in which I might try to contextualize it, to expand it, to contract it, to fit the needs that I think of are at the moment, whatever context I happen to be in. So let's get after it. Here's the first response and how you might respond to the objection that the Bible condones slavery. Okay, so um, really you're, you're using this term slavery, but, but what do you mean by slavery? That term, that word slavery. Because it sounds like you're kind of referring to what we all think of as slavery, you know, that kind of new world slavery that's part of our history in America, right? I mean, that's, that's the kind of thing we think about first. That form of slavery, though, was very different than the ancient Near Eastern servitude that is described in the Bible. Even though that word that you see in the Bible is translated as slave or slavery, whatever it may be, the, the idea of what a slave was, what that word meant back at that time is very different than what you're thinking of now. That's why it's easy to confuse the two. So what do you mean by the word slavery? Like, look, slaves in America, right? They were taken so that their masters would benefit economically, right? But that's not what big, biblical slavery was about. I mean, and, 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 uh, and most times in, in biblical slavery, people were forced into this position because of the economic relief they needed. It was often a focus of economic relief, and it was related to the servants. So in other words, in, in, in New World slavery, like we see in American history, the, only, the, the owner benefited. But in ancient Near Eastern slavery, servitude, it was the servant who benefited, because he's usually paying off a debt, and he, this was the way he would enter into this arrangement to pay off the debt. Look, American slaves were taken into to captivity against their will. Right? But in biblical times, the path into slavery was really varied depending on the situation. And in many cases, it was entirely voluntary. That's a huge difference between, the, yeah, the words are the same. But can you see two foundational differences in what we mean? Look, American slaves were, were often treated as property. That's it, just, just as property. Okay? But biblical slaves were treated as humans. And that's why there are regulations to protect them with biblical law. Very different. Three ways that, that uh, New World slavery is different than ancient Near Eastern slavery. Look, American slaves had little recourse. They, they really couldn't do much to change their situation if they wanted to be free of their master. But biblical slaves were offered several different paths to freedom. There's lots of differences between New World slavery that you might think of when we're reviewing the history of, of America and ancient Near Eastern servitude that is described in the Bible, even though the same word is used. Have you ever considered the fact that the, the servitude that's described in the Bible is nothing like the slavery that you might have in mind? Now, this is an important first step to take with people, right? We have to kind of help them see, and this is always, look, defining terms, is really the first step you should probably always take when someone offers any objection. Well, what do you mean by that term that you're offering as part of your objection? Because it just may be that you and I have two different things in mind, that you have something different in mind when you think of slavery than the biblical authors had in mind when they were referring to slavery. This was really more, and in most cases, was entirely different in its nature. Who it benefited, how you got into slavery, how you got out of slavery. I mean, these, these were very, very different notions. And this is why we see uh, slaves being, uh, the laws being in place in the Old Testament to make sure that slaves weren't treated as property. And so I think there are some, some amazing differences here. Now, and I, look, I've just touched upon the top of the icebergs in every one of these uh, areas. 
And so what I tried to do is to write about that. Just look for the slavery articles at coldcasechristianity.com and you'll see the actual verses in the Old Testament that I am referring to that draw these critical distinctions. Because it's really easy to cherry pick a verse out and make a claim against the Old Testament, against the God of the Old Testament, against Yahweh, against even the New Testament. But what you need to see, are, and think about it this way, that, that most people, when they offer that objection, they think that that word slavery is such a hot button word. That it, it, and it is, because it immediately conjures up all kinds of things in the context of the 21st century that were not in mind in the context of those people who were writing in ancient times. So I think it's important for us, right, to be able to draw those distinctions. Now, all I'm, I'm offering in quick shots is a, well, let's see, a quick shot. That's the idea, right? But, but you really need to know that, and I, I always say this, if the quick shots are kind of like the tip of the iceberg and, and you have a duty to know the rest of the iceberg. Right? I mean, it wouldn't be, uh, and the best, and the best chance you have of influencing people is going to be your ability to, to, to plumb out all the depth of knowledge on these topics. But start by answering it quickly, which we just did. And then if somebody says, well, really? Well, why would you say that? Well, now you know where to go in the Old Testament to show this distinction. And that means you're going to have to have some kind of a resource. We've tried to provide a couple of resources. I think there's three or four articles on cold case Christianity just about this topic of slavery that will plumb those depths deeper. But at least do this. At least talk to people and help them to see that that definition, that 21st century definition of slavery is not what the uh, biblical writers had in mind. I think for the most part, that is going to take you 90% to the goal in overcoming this objection, because it is the case. It is, it is simply the case. That, that, and by the way, remember that the idea of, of, of describing something and prescribing something are two different notions. The fact that the Bible will often describe the situation the way it is does not mean that it's being prescribed by God. You know, the same is true with, with uh, polygamy. You see that, that, that many of the ancient kings were polygamists. And, and the Bible describes this polygamy. It does not mean it's endorsing it. And you can clearly see that when it gets down to endorsing a form of marriage, the endorsements, the prescriptions for how we are to be and what, what marriages are to be, are clearly not polygamous. So you have descriptions and prescriptions in Scripture. We need to make that distinction for people and help them to see that there is a distinction between those two things. Okay, that being said, let's take a break. When we come back from the next break, we'll give you another slightly different way to answer that objection. And again, you might end up putting these two things together. You might end up uh, merging these two answers or taking bits and pieces out of each answer when you're talking to people. But I wanted to give you two distinct ways to answer that. We'll do the second one right after the break. In addition to Jim's daily blog and weekly podcasts and videos, Jim continues to write books designed to help you become a better Christian casemaker. At coldcasechristianity.com, you'll find a link to Cold Case Christianity, God's Crime Scene, Forensic Faith, and Alive. These resources will help you defend what you believe and share it with others. And if you want to help your kids become Christian case makers, be sure to check out the kids' versions of Jay Warner's books. Jay Warner and Susie Wallace have written three kids' books to help children know the truth and defend it in the public square. All three books mirror Jay Warner's adult books, chapter by chapter. And best yet, the kids' books are written as fictional stories that will turn your kids into detectives as they solve mysteries and learn about Christianity. There's also an Interactive Academy website at CasemakersAcademy.com where your kids can join other cadets and complete their own Academy Notebook. Each course has free videos, activity sheets, and more. Your young readers can even earn their own Junior Detective graduation certificates and appear on the Honor Cadet Wall. Be sure to visit CasemakersAcademy.com to learn more. Okay, now sometimes I talk about the difference between a fact and an inference. When we go to trial, we present several evidential facts to the jury. And then they will sometimes call in expert witnesses that will make inferences from those facts in front of the jury. And the jury is to evaluate the expert, because maybe this is a field that the jury has no expertise in and uh, really could not make a proper inference without the help of somebody to do this. Uh, so it's an expert. That's fine. So we bring in the experts. But when it gets time to actually um, 
think about the evidence, the facts, and make an inference, render a verdict. We remind jurors that they have to step back from the experts because, by the way, we're going to bring in an expert and they're going to infer something about this evidence and they're going to bring in an expert on the defense side and they're going to try to infer something totally different. Remember, in criminal trials, we present 7, 8, 10, 30, 40, 50 pieces of evidence. It's not like the defense team comes in and presents a bunch of new evidence. No, they simply bring in new experts to make different inferences from the evidence we've already used. So in the end, it's going to be important for us to make inferences from evidence. This next response to the idea that, that somehow the Bible condones slavery, I think kind of trades on this idea. The idea that we are going to do our best to, to step back and realize that lots of people have looked at the biblical evidence and they did not infer that God endorsed uh, um, slavery. I mean, you might look at this biblical evidence, the, the verses in the Bible, and you might you know, listen to the atheist memes that try to make one kind of inference. But it's pretty clear. And, and sometimes what happens is people will say, well, wait a minute. Mm -mm -mm. Uh, Christians historically in, in the 1800s pointed to Scripture to endorse and confirm their holding of slaves. So, so there, there you go. So, so don't think that we're the only... Look, there's lots of Christians who have historically understood those verses to mean that God endorses and condones slavery. Now, I've, I've heard that kind of pushback. Have you? So the question becomes, okay, okay. So that's even another level of objection here that the Bible condones. It's this idea that not only does the Bible condone slavery, that even Christians who have read the Bible knew that was true. Really? That's about whether or not the biblical evidence is being properly inferred by the evaluator, right? Do jurors do a good job of taking the facts and arriving at a correct inference? That's kind of how this next response is grounded. So let's take a look at how we're going to respond to this now in a slightly different way. I'll put it on your screen. Here we go. We're going to start off, by the way, in a similar way to the last response. Okay, look, slavery that's described in the Bible you realize that's nothing like the kind of slavery that you know that we typically think of in the modern world, right? I mean, in most cases, it was far closer to what we now call indentured servitude. This idea that, you know, people are in, uh, involved in this either because they were accused of a crime, which, is, which was often the case back then. You were sometimes put into in, uh, indentured servitude because you had committed a crime. Or you're just working to pay off a debt. By the way, I want you to think about that. Today, if you commit a crime, we have penitentiary systems in place to punish you. But back then, there were no penitentiary systems in place. If it, it, the crime was egregious, it was just a death penalty crime. And if the crime was not egregious, you were usually put into some form of indentured servitude, even for war crimes, until you worked off your debt. Your, your debt to the, to the society, not necessarily a financial debt. But there were some people who had financial debt, and they could work it off this way. And, but despite all that, despite that reality, many modern era Christians did read the Bible and misinterpreted the biblical descriptions of slavery the same way that you are. And they did that to advance their own selfish ideas, their own selfish subjugation of American and European slaves. That happened. I'll give you that. There were lots of Christians who improperly inferred what they took that verse out of context and they used it for their own selfish purpose. I get it. But that doesn't mean they were properly interpreting what the Bible says about slaves. It doesn't. In fact, you realize there's an entire movement, the movement that ended slavery, the abolition movement, both in America and in Europe, was formed and eventually implemented by Christians who were reading the Bible and, and reading the verses of the Bible. And from the verses in the Bible, they knew that Christian was not, that, that, that slavery rather was not the kind of slavery that we were talking about in the 21st century or back in those days, it was the 19th century. They knew that the slavery in the Bible was an entirely different form of indentured servitude. And people like William Wilberforce and Charles Spurgeon and John Wesley, in fact, the entire Quaker movement used the same scripture to argue for the end of slavery. They cited the authority of the Bible just like those who might have misinterpreted it. And they were arguing against American and European slavery. Now think about that. How do you think such a movement could, could refer to the Bible to make its case for the end of slavery? If the Bible, as you say, actually condones slavery, how, how would it possibly be that these men would rise up and lead a movement to stop slavery using what? Using the Bible. 
So again, this comes down to the difference between how people um, evaluate facts, evaluate evidence even, and then render a verdict. How do they render, how do they draw a conclusion? How do they in properly infer from evidence? So if you hear this an additional layer of objection that is sometimes offered, the idea that clearly your scripture condones slavery in so much that we know that Christians who read your book, your holy book, ended up condoning slavery. They used it to justify their ownership of slaves. Well, they were doing the same thing that atheists do today. They were taking that word slavery and applying their modern mindset to the word when in fact it never meant that in ancient Near Eastern culture. That is a huge distinction that has to be drawn. That it turns out that the abolition movement was grounded in scripture. The same scripture some people would argue condone slavery, well it happened to be the, the ground text for those who were trying to end it. How could that possibly be? Well it's because some, some, something's going on here, something's wrong, someone's improperly inferring the word the more you know about the context of how Scripture was written, the better off you're going to be. Remember, we often say that I, I don't read the Bible literally if what you mean is that I take woodenly any word I find in Scripture to be true. So if that was the case, I would read Psalms and think that God's got wings because it says that we are covered. You know, with the, No, that clearly is I try to read the Scripture as the author intended me to read it. And if that's the case, and we think that's good, that hermeneutic is good, when we're reading other passages of Scripture, clearly it's got to apply to this word. If you want to understand what the biblical authors meant in these passages, you would have to understand how they defined and how they experienced this indentured servitude that we now call slavery, and that's the word we apply to it. I really wish that, that people would stop using that word as the Greek translation, that we would at least understand the context of how that word was used and change it in Scripture. That would be, I think would be a good idea, because it's just causing this kind of confusion. But people who did know the context of indentured servitude in the first century were able to overcome all of that. And they were able to make a case against Christianity from the very scripture that atheists say condone it. So I think that's going to help you to take a step with your uh, friends, with your family members, as they try to navigate this difference, this difference between uh, new, new World uh, Slavery and Ancient Near Eastern Slavery. And remember, all of these uh, articles and their depth are available to you at coldcasechristianity.com. Hope that helps for this week. We're going to come back next week and do yet another objection that's offered against Christianity. Until then, I'll see you right back here at Cold Case Christianity. Thanks for joining us at the Cold Case Christianity broadcast. If you're interested in more information about this week's topic, please visit coldcasechristianity.com. For a thorough investigation of the reliability of the New Testament Gospels and the case for Christianity, be sure to purchase Cold Case Christianity, God's Crime Scene, Forensic Faith, and Alive.